First of all, welcome again to the most concentrated aggregation of IQ in the Bay Area today, Friday, August 31st, 2012. <clears throat> if we were a bowling league, we'd be in the Bowling Hall of Fame. Um, I'm a teacher, <clears throat> so I'm used to standing in front of people and talking. I'm a scholar, so I'm used to reading conference papers. But I'm not a speechifier. Seeking help with this new role, I huddled with my closest and most trusted advisors, a group I call the Brain Trust, and asked them for help. One of these advisors simply asked, can you deliver the speech in pirate speak? <laughs> Another counseled me, don't say anything. Just play Devo's Whip It really loud. <laughs> I want you to know that both of these individuals hold law degrees from very fancy schools. <laughs> A third member of the Cognitariat asked me simply, what do you want to do to your audience in terms of speech, <laughs> not otherwise? Uh, this was very helpful, uh, though it required a bit more self-reflection, which I'm sometimes uncomfortable with. Uh, but let me add that this third wise person holds a degree from a land-grant institution on the Great Plains. That's all I'm saying. There are virtues to inertia, stability, predictability. But today, there's little point in eulogizing these virtues. Have we ever understood more viscerally the description penned by a well-known German philosopher of yore, quote, all fixed, fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. There are, of course, defects to predictability. One of these is what the sly American rhetorician Kenneth Burke called the bureaucratization of the imaginative. Through the power of order and repetition, what begins as inspiration culminates in dull routine. Institutions develop original acts of creation into standard operating procedure. And so, in a volatile and tricky world, institutions offer us security and comfort. But as Burke reminds us, institutions can also fetter the imaginative and resist, baffle, and frustrate change. And make no mistake, change is coming. Change is right here on the stage. It's in this auditorium. And whatever happens on November 8th, we're not going back to halcyon days. That's gone. We often intuitively see change as something that happens to us or that we simply react to. My point today is relatively simple, uh, even if I use too many Latinate words, as my speech coach told me. Uh, our shared academic way of life already entails a more complex and useful way of thinking about change. Today is a day of beginnings, so permit me to be bold. You might recall Ezra Pound's dictum, make it new. Schumpter is famous, of course, for elaborating on the gales of creative destruction. The French surrealist André Breton once described Frida Kahlo's art as, quote, a ribbon around a bomb. And Picasso famously declared, every act of creation is first an act of destruction. What we share with these heroes of modernism is a similar involvement with the dialectic of creation and destruction. The dialectic of learning and unlearning drives our teaching. Academic freedom means nothing without the necessary friction between the critical and the conventional. Authentic scholarship begins in the ceaseless tension between skepticism and doxa. Separated from the hot mess of destruction and creation, education becomes mere training, and the university devolves into knowledge factory. In other words, our academic life teaches us that deconstruction is also always a moment of reconstruction that without some degree of disintegration or dissonance or dissidence, there can be no access to new knowledge or understanding. Change is also opportunity. And we, gathered here today and elsewhere on campus, 
are already supremely equipped to exploit the possibilities hidden within disruption. As my friend and former colleague Marshall Berman once wrote, quote, to be a modernist is to make oneself somehow at home in the maelstrom, to make its rhythms one's own, to move within its currents in search of the forms of reality, of beauty, of freedom, of justice, that its fervid and perilous flow allows. Or as my current colleague, Jeannie Stowers, more succinctly put it last week, change, change, solicits, pardon me, change solicits us to quote, new ways of being and doing. In short, colleagues, we are connoisseurs of change. And what I'm proposing today is simply this, the values that bind us together in our common enterprise, openness, community, criticism, inquiry, debate, are not obstacles to change, nor are they besieged by change. These are the values that must drive change and guide us to the fervid and perilous flows ahead. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to put a smiley face on disaster. I'm not offering consolation. I am urging against the fate of Ozymandias. Perhaps some of you may know that famous Shelley poem, which warns against the hubris of denying change in time. Our recent National Poet Laureate and Cal State Fresno colleague, Philip Levine, offers perhaps a more homely version of Ozymandias in one of his many poems about Detroit, his native city. Wandering through an abandoned factory, Levine's speaker sees in the piles of rotting machinery emblems of, quote, the gradual decay of dignity. Quote, men lived within these foundries, hour by hour, the speaker continues, Nothing they forged outlived the rusted gears, which might have served to grind their eulogy. Applying what we already know and understand about change and working together, I absolutely and fundamentally believe we can escape the fate of Levine's eulogy. Welcome to the academic year. Welcome to the work ahead. Let's get going. Thank you.